Well, my fellow errorists, welcome back to the Library of Mistakes. It's not, there are lots and lots of seats at the front, by the way, so you, you don't have to look around for a seat, just come straight up to the front. Uh, it's not that long ago that we were all here, and uh, it's only now that I've discovered, I've lived in this country since 1989, and now I've only, only tonight discovered what, how romantic Scottish men are. There are so many couples here tonight in Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, yeah, no comment. <laughs> Uh, so just a couple of the, the, the usual announcements. As, as you know, we, we, we live stream uh, and it's recorded. So uh, please tell everybody if they didn't see it tonight and they want to see it, it'll be up on the website. We run a course in finance as well, available online. But I'm happy to announce it's going to be taught here in the library. We haven't run the course, the practical history of financial markets. We haven't run it in Edinburgh for a very long time. And now that we have this facility, we will actually run it here in May 7th, 8th. And ninth, if you're interested uh, in that, all of this information is obviously on the, on the website. We are selling, and we've already sold, I guess, some of Dan's book, which is the back, and Dan will be there signing them afterwards. You get a free drink, and you have to pay for Dan's book, but you get it at a discount. So uh, I don't know how that fits in with the history of dividends, but uh, we can no, no doubt talk about that. Uh, and also we have the Market Mind Hypothesis uh, book for sale as well at the back of the room. Now, Dan was not originally uh, trained in economics. He was trained in Russian history. He is a doctor in Russian history. That Russian history may have had a, a great future, I think, until the wall came down. But anyway, suddenly you were looking for something else, and you ended up working at Federated. And we were discussing earlier on, you may be in finance, but the historian bubbles up. Indeed. And the historian came to play a role in Dan's career in finance. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, which is what the probably I would describe it as the role that dividends used to have. Mm -hmm. And you say the role that they will have again. Indeed. A transformation. And yes. why that transformation is very important for all of us. So Dan's going to talk a little bit about 10 minutes about mistakes, I think. Yes. 20 minutes about the book. We'll have a brief conversation on dividends. And as quick as possible, we'll open it to the floor. Because I did say to Dan, the one problem we've never had in this library is a lack of questions. So, Dan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. And thank you, David, for, for arranging this. And thank you, everyone, for coming out on Valentine's Day uh, in the winter in Scotland. The, the date of publication of a book was not really the choice uh, of mine. It was the publisher set the date six months ago. And when they sent me the email, and they said, February 14th. And I, I wrote back, you can't be serious. And so that's just, that's just it. So uh, I started making online jokes about... You know, no gift can make your sweetheart's heart race bet more than, than a book on the history of finance and so forth and so on. So thank you for coming out. We should have had bars of chocolate or something as well to go along with the book, but uh, really do appreciate you coming out. Uh, I really am delighted to be here and to consider, hopefully Russell will consider my application to, to become an errorist. I, I think I have an almost uniquely... Uh, qualified application, I, I believe it's possible that I am doubly qualified in an errorist. I, uh, my first career, as Russell mentioned, was trained as a historian of modern Russia. And I did that from my undergraduate years through 1997, but have continued to think about, follow, and, and write uh, about, at the time it was the Soviet Union, then it becomes something, something post-Soviet Russia. Now I just refer to it as modern Russia, different terminology, etc. Recent events in the last two years, specifically Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, made me realize uh, to what extent potentially you could consider that an entire group of people that is academic Russianists, which I still really identify as, even though I have a day job in the capital markets, uh, could collectively have made just an enormous error. And really, for the last two years, I've been thinking about that. And you think about what leads you to a particular topic and the methodology that you use in approaching that topic. And so I was trained as a, as a historian of the Soviet Union, political culture, Bolshevik political culture in the 1920s and 30s. But as one of my teachers uh, at the University of Oxford, where I did my some of my graduate studies, said that our task, one would I ultimately would profoundly disagree with, but she said our task is to figure out where the Soviet experiment went off the rails in the 1920s and 30s. So she was a very open, av openly socialist, labor socialist, 1950s and 60s person. She was you know, nothing embarrassed about, but her idea, where did this experiment go, go off the rails? Uh, 
not just that experience, but also many of the debates in, in Russian history, which I studied, my undergraduate thesis was on a debate in the 1830s and 40s within Russia called the Russia and the West debate, the Slavophiles and the Westerners, trying to figure out where Russia's position is vis-a-vis -vis the West. And you periodically have moments about that Russia and the West debate in the middle of the 19th century, in the early 20th century, after the Bolshevik Revolution, and then it appeared to end. In the 1990s, Cold War was over, the Soviet Union failed, and the overwhelming consensus was convergence. The Russian anomaly had been figured out, solved, and they were going to adopt, as it were, Western uh, liberal ideas, even though the notion of Western liberalism is not very old itself and is very much a moving target, but the notion of Russia in the West was resolved. And uh, of course, then I woke up one morning in February 2022 and realized not only had I been wrong in any underlying assumption about that, uh, but that an entire community of uh, academics and um, I think government officials and public policy people who naturally assume some sort of convergence had a real comeuppance. So uh, not that there weren't individuals who said that's not going to happen, but if you think about the dynamic, and this is why I kind of transitioned to finance, if you think about the dynamic of studying a particular topic or being a practitioner, you can't hate it and assume it's going to fail every single day. Otherwise, you just <laughs> won't go to work. You have to assume there is a rhyme or a reason to what you're doing, that you're going to figure it out, make it better, whatever the case may be. And from the perspective of having left the profession as a Russianist and, and 25 years ago and then seeing what's happened recently, I realized that I probably shared that bias. Let's figure this out and, and convergence will eventually happen. And then history hits you in the face, uh, really, in, in a profoundly uh, disturbing way. So that is my first uh, qualification for, for being an heiress. I think it's kind of a big one. Um, <laughs> But I, I did move on and, and have made an effort at a, a second uh, major error, which is finance, the folly of finance. Um, but I'm not entirely certain that I'm going to succeed as an errorist in finance because I'm not really convinced yet that I'm totally wrong in regard to finance. And as Russell said, uh, when I made the transition, uh, I had to very quickly memorize the rules. A show of hands, because Russell was pointing this out. Uh, uh, those of you who have the CFA or the British equivalent of the CFA uh, uh, charter, anyone? Yeah, you don't have to be embarrassed about it. This is recorded. <laughs> this is online. Uh, but we won't tell anyone. We won't hold it against you. Uh, it is uh, in my record officially. When I left uh, academic studies and went into Russian studies and went into business, I had to make kind of a forced transition. I, I threw myself at it. It was a very difficult period. Uh, but as part of that, I had to quickly memorize the rules of a new industry, totally new industry for me. I had no background. I made the transition from being a humanist to finance at age 33 without ever having opened an Excel spreadsheet and with no background in finance. Uh, that was difficult. I don't recommend that any of you uh, try that at home. Uh, so I, I quickly memorized the rules. I did the CFA exam. At that time, I was given once a year. It's an extremely, un in person, not online, extremely unpleasant experience. It took up three years. My wife, who was here in the background, can attest to how difficult it was to be married to somebody, a young couple, uh, uh, going through the CFA exam. Uh, three lost springs. But I memorized the rules, got into the profession, started as a stock analyst, and made my way. But... After a certain point that I settled in the new profession, the historian in me would not, would not stay down. And you, know, you can take the per with a bad joke coming up, uh, spoiler alert, you can take the person out of history, you can't take the history out of the person. So I, I began to think about what I was doing, and I asked some very simple questions that I think a historian might reasonably ask about the finance uh, profession. You'd think this would not be a radical notion, however, finance and investments as a profession is, I think, remarkably bereft of any historical sensibility. Uh, and so I was asking very basic questions, which appeared to be quite radical. But the simple question I started asking is, okay, where did these rules come from? Where did this framework, the CFA in particular, but the framework, where did they come from? Why are we pursuing them this way? And what is the history of investing 
and is this period different than others? And I came to the conclusion that this period, meaning in retrospect it's described in the book from the 1990s to the present, is profoundly different than most forms of business investment. And I asked, well, why, why is that? And so this book, uh, The Ownership Dividend, is an explanation, my explanation, of how what I consider to be an anomalous period in investing, the 1990s, specifically in the US, uh, but to some extent elsewhere as well. The 1990s to the 2020s, where it came about. I wrote a prior book, which I should have brought with me, but it's a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger, but I'll donate it uh, somehow to the library in 2018, asking the same question about modern portfolio theory. Now, modern portfolio theory, for those of you who are not familiar with it, that is, those of you non-CFA people, is sort of the, the Bible of modern finance. You do not, thou shalt not criticize modern portfolio theory. It's just, you take it as a given. And if if you're asked for any reason what you're doing within an investment context, well, you say, well, you know, it's modern portfolio theory. That's why we're doing this. Um, but modern portfolio theory struck me as uh, very unusual. It was developed in the 1950s and 60s to address some very specific problems in the 1920s and 30s. That's the historian in me asking, where did modern portfolio theory come from? Well, if you look at the history of modern portfolio theory, Harry Markowitz and others working on it, it's to address a vacuum of a theory of investment that existed in the 20s and 30s, which led or contributed to the crash uh, and the depression. And there were no rules at that time. Finance and investment was just coming into being. So after the crash and a couple decades later, some young people, Harry Markowitz, who just passed away, comes up with a set of rules that, that fills that void. He got a Nobel Prize for it, well-deserved. He, f he created something that had not existed before. The problem is it was created in the 1950s and 60s, and it used very 1950s and 60s kind of intellectual technology. I, f fast forward 60 years, I am saying, well, are those rules and circumstances still apply? How, show of hands, just someone answer the following question, and feel free to get it wrong. What do you consider, how many securities should be in a diversified portfolio? If no one asks, I'm going to ask Russell, but someone, please, someone young, 40 or younger, please answer the following question, including your, in your ETF or passive uh, 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 portfolio that you assume 100 securities in the, in the passive portfolio. What is a properly diversified portfolio? Oh, he's an academic. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Next. Next. Thousands, yeah. So uh, he, he knows too much, uh, but he is correct. <laughs> Let me answer the question because I don't think in the back. So uh, in, in the 1920s and 30s, a standard portfolio or a speculative portfolio might have one or two investments in it, securities, two or three. Harry Markowitz said to his credit, you know what? If you have nine plus cash, you get a better outcome. Now... Again, this is the difference of being applying a historical approach to a uh, contemporary problem. Now, if you have less than 1,000, that is, all you need is a few ETFs or a few passive funds, and you have 1,000 different investments in your portfolio, that's not diversification. That's just owning the market. So what passes for modern portfolio theory and why has changed dramatically. And as a historian, I simply say, OK, maybe 1,000 is better than 9 or 10, but don't call it the benefit of diversification, which is the hallmark of modern portfolio theory. Call it owning the market. That's great. Harry Markowitz said absolutely nothing about owning the market. So it was that type of approach of uh, asking where the rules came from that led to the, to the current book. And one of the characteristics that was particularly important and I thought a problem with modern portfolio theory is that when Harry Markowitz is working on basic diversification, a basic theory of investment, a theory of a portfolio, every security had an income stream. The notion of a serious security in 1952 or 1959, when Markowitz is writing, without an income stream doesn't exist. There would have been busted railroads, failed companies, frauds, startups, etc. But in terms of serious investments, whether it's land, a business, a private enterprise, a public security, the notion of 
a serious investment without an income stream to measure it, to value it, uh, to be an owner of it and have an access to the income stream simply didn't exist. One of the problems with modern portfolio theory and then more directly addressed in the ownership dividend is the disappearance of the dividends from very successful businesses, large businesses that in any other context would have an income stream. It's particularly relevant now if you think of, or as a minority owner, meaning a non-majority owner of a business. If you control the business like Warren Buffett does, you don't need the income stream because you control the entire business. You can literally direct the reinvestment, you can direct the capital spending, and you don't have to trust management because you are management. It's a very convenient situation to be. But as a minority investor in businesses, which characterizes almost, I assume, most people in this room, uh, the necessity of uh, having some sort of agency control, I don't want to get into agency theory because it's a whole separate topic, but some means of you don't trust management entirely, you want to hold their feet to the fire, it's academic term for that is, is the agency problem. And uh, a dividend is a way of, as a minority owner of a business, having some influence in the ownership of the business. It's a very standard approach in, in developed markets in the United States up until the 1990s and, of course, in private business. And so where'd the dividends go? Where'd, where'd Waldo go? I mean, the dividends are gone by the time I enter the, the, the stock market in 1999-2002. The yield of the U.S. stock market at that time is around 1%. Payout ratio is 30%. Um, and U.S. investors, in particular, uh, don't even want dividends anymore, but are particularly happy to just have share prices going up and down. Uh, and that's considered perfectly normal. It's been that way for the last 30 years. So, uh, in this book, I asked the question, well, how'd that come about? It's very anomalous. Very few people own a business, whether they're a minority owner or a majority owner, without some interest in the cash flow of the business. You don't own real estate. You don't own rental apartments. You don't, own, you don't work. A show of hands of those of you who work for a firm where every two weeks they give you a slip of paper that you go to the market, the stock market, sell that asset, and then use the funds to... Uh, purchase groceries and pay the rent. Nobody. That's just not how the world works. The butcher does not accept your share price, uh, your, your stock certificate as payment. Uh, so how did the U.S. stock market get uh, uh, to an environment in which the S&P 500 companies, the largest 500 companies, uh, had such low cash payments, such a low payout ratio, and uh, such an anomalous environment in which stock ownership did not entail, business ownership did not entail a share of the profits, but instead simply was watching the green and the red on a screen. The textbook definition, by the way, of speculation, not business ownership. Look it up in the, in the, in the dictionary. And I thought, well, that's unusual. And so uh, I guess where, where did that come from? You can see the numbers really fall off in the 1990s, the yield and payout ratio, and continue to this day. And so the, the summary of the book, it's described in much greater detail, uh, is uh, the, the main reason, and it's an important reason for anyone working in business or all thinking about business, is really the 40-year decline in interest rates has profound impact. Have you had Edward Chancellor in here? I'm yes. sure you must have, yeah. of course. You know, Edward Chancellor, in, whose book is upstairs, I saw it, uh, The Price of Time, really, really worth reading. Uh, he goes on at, really at length about the implications, and he's looking at the interest rates over hundreds of years. Um, interest rates declining for 40 straight years in the United States warps the mind. It's that simple. It just changes how people think about risk and return, and it was his, created historically anomalous circumstances. The necessity of having a cash return for fixed income instruments uh, for equities just went down and down and down. The risk tolerance went up and up and up because each and every year you could more or less count on the fact that risk was going down that year. The perception of risk, the cash cost of investment, the discount rate would be going down. Uh, some of the other phenomena that I looked at uh, and described in the book are kind of obvious, but I think the underlying one, the number one theme about that is... Uh, interest rates going down for 40 years, risk rates going down for 40 years. And so the book asks the question, 
in effect, what happens when risk rates or interest rates stop going down. That's not specifically a forecast about interest rates. It's simply asking a question about when they stop going down. It's not a matter of saying interest rates are going up, therefore do this, do that. It's an if risk rates stop going down, how will investor behavior and corporate behavior change? The second uh, big reason was the return of or the uh, uh, growth of, of buybacks, share buybacks, a particularly U.S. phenomenon uh, made legal. It was actually legal before 1982, but becomes easier to execute due to a, an IRS uh, and SEC law in 1982 that made it easier for companies to buy back their shares without being charged with uh, share price manipulation. Um, buybacks surpassed dividends from the S&P 500 companies in the mid-1990s and have never looked back, I think, one or two years when they were uh, closer. When companies, when the stock market goes way down, buybacks, of course, stop. Dividends stop less. But in general, it's been much more on uh, year after year, uh, close to a trillion dollars in 2020, uh, Two of buybacks, I think 800 million in 2020, 800 billion in 2023, about 550, 600 billion in dividends in those years. Um, so buyback phenomenon. Everyone loves buybacks. Stock market loves buybacks. Wall Street managers love buybacks. Hedge funds love buybacks. CEOs love buybacks. Media loves buybacks. Uh, everyone, except for the, the actual widows and orphans getting the dividends, everyone else loves buybacks. They this is standard knowledge that why everyone on Wall Street would like buybacks. It helps their pay packets, helps the optics of the stock. It, it sounds good, looks good. Um, the argument in the book is that the bloom is off the rose for buybacks. Yes, everyone knows what they do, but uh, critics of Wall Street, and particularly the period that we've had from the 1990s to the 2020s, referred to as the financialization of results, where Buybacks just change the optics. Buybacks don't change the, the fundamental productivity or, uh, of a business. They're simply packaging it. We were discussing in the green room. The green room is this little, <laughs> these two chairs over here beforehand. Uh, uh, Merton, uh, uh, Merton Miller and, and Franco Modigliani talking about the repackaging of assets. It's from a very important article that is used to justify buybacks and not paying a dividend from 1958 and 1961. But basically, buybacks are just repackaging assets. They're not productive uses of capital. Uh, but boy, are they popular. And my, my argument is, OK, after 30 years, they are, they are, uh, they're known to be what they're known to be. Uh, the government in the US has even started taxing them. Uh, I, more supportive of, of the disinfectant of sunshine, but buybacks are what they are. The third reason uh, dividends disappeared from the U.S. stock market is the NASDAQ phenomenon, uh, Silicon Valley. Um, congratulations, well done, bravo. World-changing stuff, uh, all good. Um, maybe not all good, but a lot good. Uh, and uh, that, that is, there, there's, I'm not casting any shade on the technology that has come out of the life-changing, world-changing technology. My point in the book is those companies have matured. We're going to get to that in the Q&A. We have a easy setup. The day after the book was published, it actually, they moved up the publication date to January 31st on me. The day after that, Meta announced a dividend. Apparently, Mark Zuckerberg got an early copy of the book, <laughs> decided to announce a dividend the next day. The, li uh, the library of mistakes is great par, you know, Dan, don't lock it. <laughs> so the, the technology companies have matured. They're large. Uh, and the question becomes, uh, can they now afford to pay a dividend or not? Can they behave like normal businesses and pay a dividend? So those are the three kind of academic or in, um, inside, I would refer to it as wrong audience, but inside baseball, there must be a, a uh, inside cricket or uh, rugby reference. But those are the inside finance, inside baseball descriptions for why dividends left. I would also point out a chapter that's getting a lot of coverage and is fairly controversial, which is about the politics. Uh, if you consider the global uh, neoliberal paradigm. Uh, it really runs from 1980 to 2020. Uh, we'll start here. Margaret Thatcher elected in 1979. Ronald Reagan in 1980. Deng Xiaoping comes to power in China in 1979. Interest rates peak in 1981. Buybacks are uh, um, legalized, uh, facilitated in 1982. You have the, Mar uh, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc collapse a few years later. You have the march of capital, unfettered march of capital throughout the world. Um, 
uh, anyone know, everyone know who Francis Fukuyama is, kind of the champion of the liberal ideal? He declares victory. Um, con- the Russianists, my community, declare, converg- declare victory and convergence and move on to other things. Uh, and it seemed like that was the perfect environment for um, uh, a successful speculative environment in which dividends as a form of surety or insurance or certainty just aren't that relevant. And that, too, has come to an end. It started coming to an end or unraveling in 2016 with Brexit, 2016 uh, with Donald Trump uh, coming to power, 2020 China, COVID, 2021, the Trump's attempted coup in the United States. 2020, the bottoming of interest rates in the United States in September of 2020. Um, uh, Russia invading Ukraine, meaning challenging Fukuyama's ideal that the liberal ideal and market economics are, are the sort of end of history, a very unfair characterization of his work. Uh, but but sh- that idea is, is you know, grotesquely challenged in, in February of 2022. Um, so all of that coincided with the starting date, the 1980s, early 1980s, and end date to the 2020s. During that period, interest rates are coming down, dividends are disappearing. The argument in the book is that, well, with all those factors that facilitated this abnormal period now being challenged or in abeyance or reversed, then what is likely to happen? I view the, the argument in the book as simple mean reversion, that a business is a business is a business, business ownership, minority business owner, it's not that controversial of an idea to expect to share the profits after uh, all business and investment needs have been met. But when I was making the rounds the last few weeks and months, a lot of the journalists are saying, well, this is a radical idea, this is bomb throw. It's historical mean reversion. This is this is not radical at all. This is you are just within a paradigm. It's very hard to see outside of a paradigm, particularly a paradigm that's lasted forty years. It's a full career and then some for most people. Uh, to say, well, this is an anomalous period. I think this is actually going to change. That has been uh, met with skepticism among many in the media. It was met with sort of open arms, however, by one person in particular, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> so at that point, <laughs> I will turn it over to, to you for, for questions. Dan, I, I want to start with the agency problem because it is a, a big problem, managerial capitalism, the link with owners, it's a big thing. Are you suggesting that perhaps the dividend is going to make that better? And I just want Maybe to quote, less worse. Less worse. Yeah. Uh, just to, to, so I'll, I'll read something from the book. This is actually a quote that you have here from someone called Michael Jensen in the book. And then you can maybe tell us why, how you think perhaps the dividend is perhaps a solution. So uh, payouts to shareholders reduce the resources under managers' control, thereby reducing managers' power and making it more likely they will incur the monitoring of the capital markets. Conflicts of interest between shareholders and managers over payout policies are especially severe when the organization generates substantial free cash flow. The problem is how to motivate managers to disgorge the cash rather than investing it at or below the cost of capital or wasting it on organization inefficiencies. So this agency problem we have, how is the how do you think if society wants to solve that problem, is that going to drive a bigger dividend? Is that something else behind this? It's you know what you said is we own businesses, we want a cash flow, we start demanding it and managerial capital to change. Yeah, I think there's a real conflict there. Uh, the dividend is at best a partial solution. Uh, we do have these limited liability corporations with uh, boards of directors who are acting in your interest. Show of hands of people who think the board of directors actually act in your interest. I'm the chairman of a company, so uh-huh. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this company, but very few others. So uh, it's an uneven power relationship. Legally, it's a very robust system of corporate governance. In reality, it's a very uneven power relationship. It's precisely because of that uneven power relationship that at least a little bit on the margin, you're, you're uh, keeping managements, I wouldn't call them honest, but you're not giving them free reign. Listen, I have a 19-year-old. If I give him a lot of money, he'll spend a lot of money. If I give him a little bit of money, he'll spend a little bit of money. He's wiser when he has less money rather than when he has more money. It's not that complicated. I don't know that C- corporate CEOs are much different than my, my uh, 19-year-old. But um, 
he's listening, by the way. He's hot. <laughs> hi, hi, Sasha. Yeah. Uh, uh, he is a, a student at the fresh, first year at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, so we're very pleased with that. Uh, so uh, the problem of, of broader co problem that you raise about uh, corporate structure and corporate governance, uh, probably a topic for another day involving uh, um, how the pendulum should swing a little bit more towards the middle there, because it's clearly the pendulum has swung in the direction of what I refer to as the imperial CEO with very little board control. Uh, it's more of a problem in the United States than I think it is in, in Europe. You have supervisory boards here that are, take their jobs, I think, more seriously than Elon's friends who get appointed to his company and you know, allow anything, pretty much. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that the dividend a la Jensen is the solution. It is, okay. It's just a partial solution that mitigates a little bit a tremendous power imbalance. Elon's also watching, by the way. Then I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so the data, let's start with the data. Parrot ratios, I think, after the war are around 60%. They end up at 30%. But the fascinating thing is when the parrot ratio was high, investment by corporations was very high. When the parrot ratio was low, it, they've been very low. Now, there's more to cash return to shareholders than dividend parrot ratios. There's buybacks. But... Explain that post-war period. Here's, these are corporations desperately in need of capital to, in, to invest in the consumer economy, changing the economy from a wartime economy, and yet they still have high payout ratios. So we may be having to go through another period of massive investment, particularly if we're not dealing with China so much. So well, how does this fit with the need? And I think most people recognize it's a need for greater investment. Yep. And it's really an ironic, paradoxical situation even throughout the 19th century when we're build, building railroads here and railroads in the United States and building out the industrial infrastructure both here and in the United States, those companies pay dividends. And it it's, uh, might strike you as surprising that companies would need to do that, but I think the sensibility since simply was, I, those companies need cash, I expect a cash return. And they made the math work. The difference is now, interestingly, as you point out, the book has a, a comparison of capital intensity, that is plant property and equipment as part of, as a percentage of sales for businesses in the 50s and 60s versus now. Of course, it's much, much lower now because we outsourced everything to China. So the companies don't need as much capital. They don't pay it out. That's the historical anomaly. If we have to rebuild the capital infrastructure of the West because we've spent the last couple of decades just optimizing stock market returns and outsourcing all of the heavy capital intensity to uh, foreign countries, specifically in Asia, where's the money going to come from? Well, it's less of a problem than it appears because there's a trillion dollars available for that. It's the buybacks. Where did that money go? It went into buybacks. Um, so I do some rough math about intent, uh, increased capital spending, 200 basis points of margin for the S&P 500. It's a couple hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, you can afford both dividends. It's really the issue of buybacks. You can afford more dividends and more investment in what I consider to be more likely to be vertically integrated businesses because we've completely gotten rid of that in the last couple decades just from the money spent on, uh, on buybacks. In some instances, maybe the dividend growth has to slow, but I, I do agree that in this new paradigm that we'll call it the post- uh, global neoliberal paradigm to post build everything in China and buy it back in the United States in Walmart very, very cheaply. We've been importing def deflation for decades. That's just not going to work anymore. Uh, that we are going to have to spend more on, on uh, plant property equipment and people. AI is not the solution. AI is just part, a new technology development. Um, we have underspent on people and on uh, even service industries. Uh, not to mention the manufacturing industries for the last couple of decades. But I think that money is there through the buybacks uh, or to slower dividend growth, something I'm uh, quite comfortable for. One of the, when I'm meeting with, cus with the companies that we invest in, it is often a challenge presented to us, you're stifling growth. It's an absolute canard. Uh, as a minority business owner, in the case of my day job, a fairly significant minority business owner, that is, we own a lot of shares in these companies, we're looking for a share of the profits after all reasonable, after all operating expenses and reasonable investment expenses, after reasonable investment expenses have been made. Well, guess what? Those reasonable investment expenses, they're going up. 
They've been going down for decades. They're going up now. Uh, so I, we're well aware of that. It's a, it's a, a balance. There's no perfect solution. But yes, the, the S&P 500 companies need to, to spend more to do the exact same thing now that the, we'll call it the China option, is, is okay. simply no longer available. Now, another structural change which the higher dividend might help is employee stock ownership. We're not talking about the CEO necessarily here, yep. but the average employee. Uh, you've got some great data in here about how the higher dividend yields used to assist that program. Do you want to talk about that again and why, in terms of, I don't know if we're allowed to I mention the word Piketty, and, well, it's my big mistakes, we can mention the word Piketty. Uh, in terms of the redistribution of wealth, are dividends a role towards higher stock option by employees and at least a partial redistribution of wealth. Thomas, uh, Pic pronounce Piketty. Thomas Piketty is a French economist, uh, very, very critical, come out in the last 2014, and I believe uh, a few years before as well, with some very, very dense books, which are up there, I saw them. They are, uh, yeah. Uh, very dense books, critical of capital, and basically the, the simple idea is, and he's absolutely correct on part of this, the returns on capital have been higher, that is the returns on investment in stock, or have been higher than the productive gains, the underlying economic growth. You can't do that forever, that you you can't have these numbers diverge, and that the stock is owned by a minority of people, the productive assets, as it were. Um, the, the people who depended upon the productive assets are the larger group of, of people and they're not participating in this. You, that gap will not, that the, the increasing that gap will not end well for anyone. That's his basic argument. Uh, can't, I don't necessarily dispute that, though. You know, some elements of his work have come under criticism. My my observation, and partially, it's just a better situation here in Europe. And I use the example of the French energy company Total. Uh, but there are other examples from a book that I wrote in 2013 called *The Dividend Imperative* about the person who created something—a U.S. structure. And I don't know what the U.K. equivalent would be, but it's called an ESOP. It's a uh, employee stock ownership plan created in the 1950s by an attorney called uh, Lewis Kelso. And it's a little complicated, this, that, the other, but there's one element to it which couldn't happen today, which makes important sense. The ESOP buys the stock on behalf of the employees with borrowed money, but pays back the loan with the dividends from the stock. If the stock doesn't pay a dividend, none of it works. An employee stock ownership program at least defined as Kelso by Kelso can't work in that environment. Um, I take that idea fast forward and say that employee stock ownership programs typical of uh, Silicon Valley and the tech economy, these obviously don't pay dividends. Uh, the employees, because there's no income associated with ownership of the stock, they have no incentive to keep it. They are incented to be share sellers, not shareholders. If, in the case of, and again I use Total, a French company that does have broad employee ownership, it's France, there's more expectation of that. Those companies pay a very good dividend and Total issues a press release every year saying how much money has gone into employee pockets. I've made the same argument to Verizon. It's very similar to Total. It's a large, mature, slow-growing company, pretty cash flow efficient. And senior management at Verizon, so one of the two or three large phone companies in the United States, has simply said, oh, the employees aren't interested, they would just sell it anyhow. We've tried. Uh, and that, I think, is, is kind of tragic, that if uh, there's, because there's a tension between uh, the workforce at Verizon, a large U.S. corporation, and management, if more U.S. employees uh, viewed the stock, now Verizon does have a very good dividend, mind you, but if more U.S. employees viewed stock is something to hold, not sell, I think you would have a greater chance of getting, again, a little bit like the Jensen issue, you know, you're not going to fix the worst excesses of capitalism with uh, uh, an agent from an agency perspective with a dividend. You're also not going to fix the worst excesses of employee management problems if more employees own dividend paying stock, but it might just make it a little bit easier. Everyone's rowing in a similar direction when the employees are benefiting directly in cash for holding shares as opposed to selling them. Okay, well the National Board of this country said my love is like a red, red rose, but actually it's dividends, isn't it? <laughs> uh, more of them. Uh, we are now going to open it to the audience for questions. So who's got the first question? We've got Alex down at the front here. David, just right at the front. Daniel, I wanted to um, ask you about the change in 
the um, ownership of um, stocks over, let's go back to the 1960s, which I hate to tell you when I first started managing portfolios. <laughs> but in that time, I remember investing in electric utilities and banks where the yields were between 4 and 6%. The ownership of equities tended to be much closer to individuals. And in the subsequent period since then, you've had the institutionalization of the ownership of, of um, equities, whether it's defined benefit uh, plans or any other form of uh, savings. In that time, lots and lots of cash flow has gone into those institutional um, accounts, and they haven't really needed to receive dividends. Uh, lots and lots of money has been coming in. And my question or suggestion to you is that may have now changed as we move from direct benefit to direct contribution when we get an older population. And the time comes when, and maybe Meta is the best example of that, when suddenly boards wake up to the fact that putting the dividend up puts the share price up rather than announcing share buybacks to get it. And I have to be very cynical about whether sh share buybacks, certainly in the short term, do put share prices up or not, but that's another issue. So is there some merit in the fact that the demographics of ownership have changed and the different circumstances that would add to the thesis yeah. that dividends could well be making a comeback? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think I have a slightly different answer because the demographic expectation, the baby boomers, I, I am actually technically a baby boomer. I was born in 1964. Uh, we are retiring in droves. I can't wait, but I'm not quite there <laughs> yet. Uh, uh, but the expectation of income uh, from the baby boomers has been around actually for 10, 15 years because my older baby boomers already have hit retirement. And so why have they not been demanding income? And I think there are two reasons. One is covered directly in the book, in the, uh, the theme, the thread holding the book together, which is uh, declining interest rates. The second reason is part of the anomaly of the last, particularly the last 15 years. Retirees and institutions have been funding consumption with harvested capital gains very successfully. Why do you need income, which is taxable when it hits, if you can just sell your shares? Because remember, share prices only go up. They go up every single day. You can time them at your convenience. So I think institutions, it has been a puzzle for me since I've been a dividend manager in the United States, why pension funds and endowments who have a 5% distribution requirement in the United States, the, the um, endowments, uh, and the portfolios I manage have around a 5% yield, they won't have nothing to do with us because they've gotten so used to a complicated solution, a market solution, which is harvested capital gains, that they haven't needed to rely on income. Plus, interest rates were coming down, so income was uh, 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 more uh, scarce. Uh, and the harvested capital gain, I'll call it a gain, but uh, mechanism has worked very, very well for several decades. The, I, I'm not a bear market person. I'm not forecasting anything going down. I'm simply going to make the statement that the assumption in Markowitz 52-59, in Miller and Modigliani, Modigliani and Miller in 58, and Miller and Modigliani in 61, in Tobin 1958, that an investor is indifferent between a harvested capital gain or a capital gain. Actually, it's not even harvested. They're not even talking engage strictly in classroom discussions, blackboard discussions. For, to fund consumption, it needs to be harvested, which is a much harder exercise. But the indifference of investors between a capital gain and a, a dividend payment that investors are indifferent. Investors may be indifferent. I'm not indifferent. One of those is a business outcome. The other is a stock market outcome. They could not be more different. I could not imagine two things that are more different. But for the last couple decades, uh, being a stock market, funding consumption through the stock markets worked just fine. Um, again, I'm not forecasting a bear market, but with the ret what I refer to in the book as the return of the cash nexus, with interest rates no longer going down, with, with risk rates no longer going down, that bar is going to get higher. Those companies, and we saw Meta go in that direction uh, a week ago, 
I think the expectation of cash returns is going to increase. Meta, however, the day it announced a $5 billion dividend and the share price went up, I don't think it went up because of the dividend. Um, they also, the very same day, announced a $50 billion buyback. So $5 billion in dividends. It's a very wealthy company. They got a lot of money sloshing around. $5 billion in dividends, $50 billion in, in buybacks. The share price goes way up. That would appear to be prima facie evidence that I'm wrong. But I'm willing to accept that because of the kind of the green shoots that, that uh, I do think there will be other companies announcing dividends, probably with large buybacks. But it is the rise of the cash nexus other than buybacks is upon us. I can't give you the exact time and date, but uh, I, I think it is beginning. Thank you. What about the huge scam, effectively, that's perpetuated by management in these companies where, um, you know, buybacks are effectively used to, to disguise, you know, enormous stock issuance? Um, and then, you know, the, the game is played where uh, investors are convinced that adjusted EBITDA is, you know, a good thing to look at, um, you know, which masks an enormous amount of money that is effectively handed to to insiders. Um, and, and that's surely a huge um, ca you know, counterpoint to what you're arguing for here is that as long as those people are still in control, it's very hard to see how that changes, right? Yeah, I, I, maybe I wouldn't phrase it quite uh, as strenuously as you did for regulatory and compliance reasons, but uh, I, will, I will acknowledge the spirit of what you're saying uh, and, and not even disagree with it. Uh, it's fairly transparent from my desk, however, to see who's doing that and who's not doing that. And it's equally, just with a little bit of effort from your seats as well. You just look at the share count. You look at the compensation. Many buybacks are simply forms of compensation. It's a very complicated form of compensation, but it ends up just being a form of compensation. Um, many firms, many S&P 500 firms, we simply would not be able to invest if we had a rule that says we only will invest in companies that don't buy back their shares and only uh, have dividends. Because pretty much every S&P 500 company at least buys back enough shares to equal their offset, the, the share issuance. That's a very complicated, unnecessarily complicated form, but culturally um, and legally acceptable form of compensation. We can't penalize those companies. We just assume or analytically characterize those cash flows used for the buybacks as compensation. The issue is for those that go beyond compensation that claim to be returning cash to shareholders. It's not, obviously, it's returning cash to, to share sellers. Uh, those companies have a much uh, steeper hill to climb. They have to reduce their share count. And you can look at companies, and there are a, a handful of examples out there of companies that have dramatically, even after covering the option issuance, or the options are out of favor now, but restricted stock units. Even after covering them, they've still reduced their share count. If the share price has stayed steady during that period, it's kind of a win for the existing shareholders. If the share price has gone down during that period, it's also a win for the shareholders because now they own more. If the share price has gone up during that period, it, it's diluted, the, the share buyback was less effective. But there are companies that have, have done that. That's when that happens, they look good, that they've reduced the share count. The number of companies that have reduced their share count is a fraction of the number of companies that announce large buybacks. So I agree with you in spirit, but what there really is kind of a typology that in order to operate, I refer to it as a dividend investor in a stock market, I have to kind of make peace with certain things that I'm neutral about, but if the math is not horrendous, I can be neutral about it. And um, so, yeah, share buybacks are a form of executive compensation, uh, but if the share count is declining, they still will have an argument to make. It may not be my argument, but I'm not going to fight that one because it's a, kind of a losing battle. Uh, it's really the case of the companies that buy back huge amounts, still issuing lots of shares, or the share price collapses anyhow, and it's just a disaster across all, uh, whatever typology or metric you're, you're, you're looking at. Uh, just in the middle, or sorry, in the middle. Oh, there's sorry, I can't see at the back. Uh, Donnie, I didn't see you there, sorry. Just a quick question. Is this not just a battle of styles between value and growth, and you get periods where growth has done particularly well for a long period, and it will revert? It's a form of mean reversion in the market. 
Yeah, th that is often, that question has been asked, as a matter of fact, for all of our clients, even those who say that they're dividend investors, what they really want is value, so-called value investing to do well in the stock market. I, I really stick to my knitting that being a business owner is being a business owner and being a stock market investor is being a stock market investor. Stock market investors, you know, growth, value, GARP, this, that, the other. I, I'm looking at income streams uh, and trying to maximize the net present value of the income stream. It's, it's that simple. Uh, but it, you are correct that this style of business ownership is viewed as a subset of value. And value, for those of you who have not been paying attention for the last 15 years, <laughs> <laughs> has absolutely gotten crushed compared to growth. That is, investors have shown an outright preference for companies that don't pay dividends and have very high growth rates and no accountability to management whatsoever. What's that fellow's name again? What was I can't remember his name. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, I, but I, I don't pretend to call the, the growth versus value. What it has meant is that to be a dividend investor in the stock market in the United States has meant a limited opportunity set. Plenty to, uh, to diversify, but that's meant large swaths of the U.S. stock market have been, in effect, off limits. And guess what? Their share prices go up more. That distresses value investors. It doesn't really distress me that much because I'm trying to maximize the income stream. Stocks that don't have dividends that go up 50% a year just are not part of the opportunity set. But it kind of does make, make you look bad, I have to admit. But uh, at the end of the day, it's income is income and non-income is non-income. I don't have a call on the value versus growth, but one could conclude, I don't really put this in the book, one could conclude that if risk rates have stopped going down after 40 years, that's notable in regard to the value versus growth uh, uh, debate. But I, I don't really take a stand on that. Callum, you've got a question yeah. just halfway up on the left. David, just wait for the mic. Yeah, thanks very much. It's sort of linked just to the last question. How much is it? It's quite. A, it seems to me quite unique to the U.S. rather than uh, the U.K. And, and and Europe. And I say that because you take a stock like Amazon. Um, U.S. investors were quite you know, very happy to invest in Amazon for years when it didn't even make a profit. You know, let alone pay a dividend. And obviously, has it, has it made a profit yet? If you look at the cash flow, <laughs> eventually, when it gets large enough. It might be a profitable company. And it it's slightly profitable now, but okay. not enough to pay a dividend, interestingly. Well, well okay, and, it, well, and then it may, may pay a dividend. But so what, why is it far more of a, a U.S. phenomenon rather than a U.K. and, and European phenomenon? Yeah, I, I, that, that has come up, and that's a, a, a very good question, because interest rates w move kind of globally. And if the main theme of the book is about interest rates, uh, moving down to the main th uh, thread holding it together. That happened, maybe not quite to the same extent, uh, but you've had you know, rates coming down dramatically in, in, in Germany, low rates getting very low in Germany and Switzerland, rates even in the UK coming down, and then Japan's a separate situation. What Europe did not have was the buyback phenomenon and the NASDAQ phenomenon. Now, most European investors are ruining the fact that they didn't have those two phenomenon to make a quick buck and, or for the innovation. I mean, everyone is complaining about they don't have the Silicon Valley mojo, and I, I get that. But that, I think, makes the huge difference. And I think it's a little bit old world, new world. You know, it's a more conservative environment here. There was less room for the, uh, uh, the, the NASDAQ environment, Silicon Valley innovation. And uh, maybe less acceptance for buybacks. I don't know whether buybacks are legal to the same way that they are in the United States in European markets, but they, if they are, they're certainly not used anywhere near as much. Yeah, it's, from, obviously I see it from a, a macro perspective. The, mac the macro setting has been exploitable if you're a corporation. You can move your production to China and benefit from that. Yeah. You can benefit by gearing up your balance sheet because interest rates have been low, driven down by Chinese purchases of treasuries, Chinese disinflation. Mm -hmm. And not every corporation is in a society where that's acceptable. acceptable. Yeah. And America is, or maybe we should say has been. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the Japanese couldn't have prevailed and done that to the same extent. They've been socially unacceptable, mm -hmm. i.e. closing capacity, firing people, yeah. uh, gearing up the balance sheet. So maybe it's just that we have something in the structure of the corporation's relation to society, that American corporations were able to take much more advantage of this than was socially acceptable in Germany, France, even the United Kingdom or, yeah. J or Japan. 
Therefore, the downside of it turning around is, is, is much bigger. It turns out that the S&P 500 is on a much higher cyclically adjusted PE as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this, this building is for the books on political economy. I wonder ultimately if it was a political economy where these corporations had the power to do that and other corporations felt socially or politically constrained. And that, as I mentioned, is a chapter in the book that's gotten a fair amount of plays on the political economy. The global neoliberal paradigm is really driven by the United States. And as it reverses, it's reversing most dramatically in the United States as well. So the end, the end of the era of financial engineering, is that too? <laughs> that would be a little bit too out. <laughs> the end of the year, era of financialization that is violating grossly, again, I hate to use the, econo the academic reference, but violating grossly uh, Modigliani and, and Miller 1958 uh, by just changing the packaging of assets rather than the actual productive nature of those assets. Are we coming to the end of that, the financialization of the markets? Uh, one can always hope, uh, but I think the cover provided by declining interest rates is now missing. I think the cover provided by uh, endless buybacks is now being questioned. And the cover provided by NASDAQ and the Wall, uh, Silicon Valley company saying we need, we're, we're just still growing, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're in our infancy, that no longer just persuades, and plus pick up any newspaper, look at the political pages, and the cover just isn't there anymore. Uh, I think the cash nexus, we're all going to be a little less trusting, uh, and the cash nexus that will play a larger role in that environment. You know, the cash nexus is a Marxist term invented by Karl, Ma Karl Marx. Well, so there you reading, go, Axel. As I'm reading your book, I'm, I'm thinking, does he, does he understand that, this? That's, Mar that's Mar from my first career. No, I... In I, a, I oh, dear. In a, okay. No, no, in, a, in, an entirely different con <laughs> in an entirely different context than the way you use it in the book. So, Peter, we'll have the last question from Peter. Oh, sorry. We're going to have two questions, then. Gavin and then Peter. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Maybe... Uh, a similar question or observation on the demographics of ownership uh, when we consider the distribution of ownership, um, particularly who the intermediaries are. Um, depending upon how you cut it, it's estimated that over half of US stocks are now controlled in a passive manner. Yes. And also, it's fairly obvious as a fellow dividend growth investor what drives long term total returns, but with so many active managers holding stocks for less than a year, why would a management team or a board, when considering their primary shareholders, consider dividends? Yeah. They haven't had to. They haven't had to, uh, particularly the last 15 years, but over the last 30 years. I just think that the environment that has allowed that to go unquestioned is now changing. And again, it's, it's with interest rates not declining, other asset classes now pay a, a material number, whether it's cash, money funds, um, fixed income securities, government securities. Uh, they now pay a cash number. And I think just on the margin, that's going to pressure boards. And that may have been the issue, may have been, I don't know, uh, Zuckerberg did not call me up. Uh, that may have been the issue there that they realized that it's no longer a zero rate world. And they're going to meet that. They didn't meet it halfway. They met it. 10% of the way, but they moved in that direction. Uh, and I think there just will be increasing pressure on corporate managements to do that. But it's not, a, you know, it's a, a journey, not a destination in the sense of sometimes I'm asked, you know, or give me a date, you know, and I, I have no idea. The next, uh, it took 30 years to get to this situation. How long will it take to mean revert? 2024, probably not. Sometime in the 2020s, probably, maybe the 2030s. And so the question becomes a practical question. The publisher is very interested in practicality. <laughs> what to do now? How to position your portfolio now? Read the book. That's definitely uh, the most practical thing you can do. But there is, there is no specific positioning other than to not be surprised the next time a large a technology company or a consumer discretionary company uh, either uh, increases a dividend, announces a dividend, or backs off of buybacks. Peter, last question. What, what about the position of tax or how important that is? I mean, you know, Australia has a thriving dividend culture because there's not a double taxation of dividends there. God bless. I wish I could create that world in the, in the United States. Yeah, well, we had it in the UK for about uh, 25 years until 1997. Um, and uh, you know, if, you, if you're a non-taxpayer, you even got the, 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 the tax paid back that um, the company had paid on your behalf. Yeah. Um, so is, is it not just a tax position? You've got a double taxation hit on one side and you've got a an incentive to issue stock options um, on the other side. 
Yeah, the tax issue is fairly complex for U.S. investors. The U.S. investor doesn't feel the double taxation of taxes. They only know the single. As an individual investor, you only feel it. The fact that the company has less money because they've already paid tax on it, you can't see that optically. Uh, but corporate management see it. Uh, from an investment perspective, tax rates on dividends and capital gains, which is the competitive investment choice, for, particularly for the last 20 years, have been the same since 2003. Again, as a historian, I ask, why did this aversion of academics, and it's covered it at length, there are two chapters on the book, the, the hostility of academics to, to dividend investing. And there's a fairly straightforward answer. When they were writing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, taxation on dividends was much higher than on capital gains. It simply was. And that came down starting in 1986 and was equalized in 2003. It's still equalized. Actually, there's now a tax, but on the corporation, not on the investor, on dividend, on um, uh, buybacks that was recently introduced. First time ever that the pendulum has swung towards dividends from, from uh, capital gains or buybacks. But um, it's, it's neutral now. Uh, even though the double, that is the tax rate's the same, even though there is the double uh, taxation from a corporate perspective. So, yes, the dividend income stream is kind of impaired in that sense. The U.S. investor doesn't necessarily feel it that way. The main issue has been twofold. This historical bias against because, and they refer to it as the dividend puzzle, the academics who rarely seem to run businesses, or at least not successfully, no offense intended. The, uh, uh, all of their activity was done when tax rates were different. And then the main one that I get in the marketplace, even with clients, is uh, the timing. That is, a dividend occurs when it occurs. It creates a taxable event. In the U.S., it's usually four times a year. Um, whereas a harvested capital loss, I'm sorry, did I say loss? A harvested loss. capital gain. You're talking about the future. Rather yeah, than the harvested capital gain can be timed. It can, you can take it next year. If you don't need to fund consumption now, you can take it next year. Uh, and that uh, timing advantage is pretty much the only academic ammunition left. But boy, is it, it used very loudly and, and visibly. My answer is straightforward. If someone wishes, due to a timing differential, to subordinate investment policy to tax minimization policy, they're more than welcome to do it. I view uh, paying a tax on a dividend as a sign of success, a successful business venture. Uh, clearly, a lot of my clients, or would-be clients, don't. They want to avoid paying the tax man, even if it means losing money. <laughs> they will, they will avoid, you know, highly politicized society. So, uh, yeah, if you want to subordinate investment policy to tax minimization, that's a choice. I just make the statement in the book, that's a choice that is not an inevitability. I want to end with a forecast that you have in this book. Oh dear, do I put a forecast? You do put a forecast okay. in this book. Let me read it to you. It's, it's generic and it's untimed, the safest Perfect. form. <laughs> okay. I, I, uh, I know a little bit about that then. <laughs> Cash flow to management will no longer be sufficient. It will once again be cash flow to the end investor. That's the shape of things to come. You're not saying when, but that's coming back. I think that's moving in that direction, absolutely. I'll stand by that untimed, unspecific forecast. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan will now be signing copies of the book at the back of the room. As usual, please join us for, uh, for uh, some uh, drinks sponsored by Kenox Asset Management, as ever. Uh, but at this stage, please join me in thanking Dan Perez. Thank you. Thank you.